Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio, with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Rival Recon here on Anfield Index Pro. And after the Reds secured their place in another Champions League final, after what started as a nervy night in Villarreal, on this week's pod, we'll be turning our attention straight back to the Premier League and the race for the title, as Tottenham Hotspur arrive at Anfield this Saturday. So joining me on the pod to lend us his thoughts into how Spurs' season has unfolded and whether Conte's side will finish in the top four this season, we welcome back football writer for The Athletic and TIFO Football, Seb stafford Blur. Welcome back, Seb. Thanks for having me, Harry. It's nice <laughs> to be welcomed back. As always. Yeah, as always. Um, whenever it, whenever it, this fixture rolls around, and actually I was looking back at when we last, um, when Liverpool last faced off with Tottenham, and um, in, what, December of last year? And, uh, yeah. It, that that really does feel like uh, a very long time ago. Um, I think maybe maybe it's just the the sheer abundance of football, short sort of sheer relentlessness of it. Maybe all manner of things that have gone on uh, since then, sort of uh, in our lives outside of football as well. But um, I suppose that's a sort of an interesting place to start because it was pretty early on in the Conte um, sort of uh, tenure at Tottenham, and, and we and we're still very early on. I think we're just coming up to six months of of Conte being at Tottenham, but. Um, yeah, if you're able to cast your mind back to that game, it was sort of an interesting one, very competitive, two to sort of draw in the end. Um, I'd almost I'd completely forgotten sort of uh, the team that Liverpool lined up with, and um, uh, doing doing on my little bit of pre pre pod research to see that it was uh, Tyler Morton in midfield alongside James Milner um, yes, and Abby Cater. Yeah. That was when I was. Oh, I now understand why we had so. Uh, Little control probably of that game in the middle of the park, despite sort of his 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 uh, his best efforts and some of the injuries and the absences that we were going through at the at the time in that in that department. But um, yeah, what did you what did you make of that game? And um, I suppose even sort of how that early on Conte approached it and, and managed to get the side to be uh, you know aggressive and competitive because there's, there's some names there who have obviously moved on since uh, since that fixture. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think I enjoyed how competitive Spurs were. Um, and I enjoyed their aggression, actually, because I think um, it's hard to be um, entirely back in the moment. But I remember thinking at the time, I just want some competence. I just want to feel that um, this team can compete with a side like Liverpool. And obviously, there are asterisks against that game. Um, you know, Liverpool were not at full strength, obviously. Um, things have changed in the in the uh, Tottenham team since then. I'm sure we'll get on to um, Benton Core and Kulisewski uh, later on. But it was it was a good, fun, competitive game of football, and um, I think that uh, that was a game which Harry Kane should have been sent off at the beginning, and Andy Robertson got sent off at the end. Mm. Um, and there's that terrible Allison Becker mistake that let Son score. Um, I think at the time it was it was something that our fan base needed just to see that uh, okay it wasn't perfect and clearly there were some flaws and benefited a little bit from the red card clearly but um, it was a okay so this is Conte this is what he gives you because everything before had been very loose before his arrival uh, and I include the time I mean the season before it wasn't just the Nuno Espirito Santo games um, the year before under Jose Mourinho was um, for a large part pretty miserable. Hmm. Um, as it unraveled, as it always seems to be, for everybody who experiences that um, unique part of football. Um, <laughs> and I enjoyed Conte. I, I thought um, I like. I liked. I was. I think at the time I was still reveling in the novelty of the way he responded, he reacted with the crowd, and the way he interacted with our supporters, and the uh, response he seemed to engender from some of our players. And it was, yeah, it was, it was deeply encouraging. Um, and yeah, it was. The thing is, is it's been a funny time because that new stadium of Tottenham is obviously um, feels like home to a certain extent, but there aren't many memories in it. 
there aren't many i don't have many m many of my memories don't exist there for instance all of mine is still at old white hot lane and so that was a, an occasion and it felt like a proper match that you could actually that you could store in the memory bank and reference and you know I, I hadn't really thought about it actually until you brought it up and yet you know um the muscle memory is uh has taken me right back there and, and that, that's a good thing and, and because of the covid interruptions and because of the kind of the chopping and changing with managers and um you know some of the personnel issues that spurs have had over the last couple of years it's been a very uh sort of transient fluent uh, fluid time um which doesn't suit the kind of the bedding in to the new stadium experience so that that no. came up there it was, a, it was a good match yeah and no, i'm just just thinking about to yourself, actually, as you were recounting some of the incidents there, yeah, I've completely forgotten about the Kane red card. I'm sure on the day I was, uh, <laughs> Terrible I, was I was very different, but now I now remember it, yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, I also remember, yeah, the yeah, the Allison error because it's, it's it's they've they've been so rare this season from him. He's been yeah. so so incredible in one v one situations that we yeah, when he does make sort of a, an error that you consider to be you know. The, more or less his bread and butter just in the basics um it does yeah it, it does it, it does linger in the memory a little bit but um I, I mean even looking at the team sheets i mentioned liverpool's one there with some of the i mean i think uh, a combination of tyler morton and milner in midfield is uh probably one that we Klopp wasn't keen to try again after the game even sort of with the best of respect to both of them but yeah i'm, I'm looking at sort of the, the the tottenham team and as you mentioned just competence aggression you know competitiveness in that game, that was sort of what Conte was trying to engender early on. But um, you know, and Dombele in midfield alongside Harry Winks and Deli Ali, um, sort, of, sort of interesting combinations yeah, that's there. Now. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, even sort of the the way in which he was lining up with the with the defense as well. I mean, it's uh, sort of interested in sort of uh, your, your opinion on. We, we could talk about Conte maybe off the pitch in a, in, a, in a little bit, but Conte in terms of how he approached dealing with. The players he did have to work with, um, in terms of sort of how how he he, try, he tried to set them up and get the best out of them, um, and I suppose you probably could sort of divide it back down into pre and post Kuvasleski and um, Ben Tamkor, could you? Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And I, one thing I'll say about Conte is I, um, with a couple of exceptions, I think he's given most players a chance. So um, the midfield there, obviously, none of those players will be um, featuring at the weekend for different reasons. And Dombele has gone off to Leon on loan. Uh, Dele Alli is now an Everton player. Um, and Harry Winks. Harry Winks is kind of, I feel a bit sad for Harry Winks because I, there was a point where his trajectory was um, very steep indeed. But um, whether it's a kind of combination of injury or self-confidence, diminishing self-confidence or changes as manager, um, he's never really been able to call his place in the team a permanent one um and now he's kind of a he's like a sort of a relief pitcher and he'll come on and you you can use him for kind of single issue problems so if you need a bit of direct passing in your midfield then harry winks is your guy but he's not going to provide any defensive security along the way um and i, I actually i quite like the um the approach he's taken because um one of the problems conte's had is that he lost all of a skip for the classic indeterminable um Tottenham injury period which was a couple of weeks then it became a couple of months and then oh, yeah. it's just a bit a big question mark and no one knows when he's coming back I know those um, yeah oh yeah, yeah light, I, light bruising expected that soon <laughs> exactly you know a back strain that you can't scan for yeah well Oliver Skip is um you know he's a super player he's a really really encouraging complete midfielder and Conte obviously thought very very highly of him when he when he arrived at the club um, and he's been gone forever, and he's uh, he's had surgery, and he's out for the rest of the season. But um, I think he's done quite well to sort of think himself around some of these issues. Like um, Benton Cora's arrival uh, made a huge difference because he's an entirely different class of like sort of static holding midfielder. Um, clearly, the best receiver and passer in in that department at the moment. Um, compliments Pierre Emil Hoiberg very nicely. Hoiberg has been another Conte regular. Um, it's really sort of um, I don't know. I mean, I he's a very divisive player at Tottenham uh, within the fans, within the fan base, because um, he doesn't do anything flashy and he he has bad moments sometimes. But he's a he's a very solid sort of seven out of ten player, and his combination with Bentancur has been pretty good. Uh, and so Conte's ability to think him, him his way around those problems, but also not not just um, I felt at times under Mourinho um, as if some of the problems that people could see in the first eleven weren't addressed in, in the sense that uh, he just kept sending out 
um, teams with the same instructions and expecting a better result, which always struck me as very odd. Um, whereas this being more pragmatic, I think that he's found solutions. There's also been an element of meritocracy to the team. So obviously with Conte, you get wing backs and Matt Doherty was a wing back reborn for a while. He got injured, unfortunately, um, against Villa and hasn't been seen since and won't be until next season. Um, but he's, um, he has at least shown an awareness of where the issues are and um, how to kind of combat them. And it's been, I wouldn't say it's been good. I mean, it's been fine. It's been um, better than it was before. And you hmm. think maybe with with a couple of summers or with a few windows, it might get a little bit better. But I um, maybe I'm being unduly negative, but uh, I, I still don't think Tottenham are particularly good. I think they're okay, but they're in that group of teams with Man United and Arsenal who... Um, I think Arsenal are probably the best of that group, perhaps. But um, you know they're kind of as bad as each other in a way. Um, Chelsea are a little group of their own um, behind uh, you and Manchester City, of course. Um, but Spurs, I don't know. I don't trust them. I think it's because I don't. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to see from them. They haven't. Um, they haven't developed that kind of baseline level of performance yet for me to trust them. And I, and I think a lot of that comes from the midfield because at times, um, so. You mentioned the the Ndombele Ali uh, Harry Winks yeah. axis. Not even sure what axis of what. <laughs> Not evil, but it, axis of something. Yeah. Um, I still think there are too many ways now, even a couple of months further on, where you know with better players, the Benton core and, and Hoiberg will start in the middle there. Um, it's too easy to negate that group at the moment. You know, it's okay. too easy to. So, for instance, when um, when Brighton uh, came to White Hart Lane. Did a very good job of taking all the space away from Bentancourt, and then you know you saw the kind of the, the gaps in the formation, the kind of gaps between the, the different departments. Same Brentford. Um, so question still to answer. It is better, but it's it's not good. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, and I suppose I mean I was I think we we, we should come on to talk about Conte and sort of his future later on. But uh, sure. I, I think one thing that's interests me about it because we've spoken in the past <laughs> about how. You know, the likes of Mourinho um, may have acted off the pitch and sort of completely unsurprisingly in terms of, sort of some of his commentary and, and sort of how he mm-hmm. would talk about players at his disposal. And, you know, very often, woe is me. And, you know, you can't expect, you, you can't expect me to do better, you know, with these players, for example. Um, the fact that I, I'm interested in sort of how you feel Conte's approach to that side of things, because he's a very blunt, straightforward character. I think nobody was uh, surprised by that, hopefully, when... <laughs> When he came in, he, he he really has called it as he's uh, as he's seen it on many occasions. I think last time before the Liverpool game, we were speaking about some of his quotes around maybe the the exit from um, the the Conference League. Um, in terms of some of his just very blunt comments about certain players and and, and where they currently were and some some of the work that needed to be done. I mean, how how do you think that's been received by? By the fan base because I mean it's it's it's, it's hard to argue with but then still you, you're thinking about well you know, you've still got to motivate those players you, you you're you've still got to sort of um uh, be honest about the fact that you knew what you were getting yourself into uh, it, it seemed like it when you when you took the job I mean I'm interested in your thoughts about how Conte's um, handled that side of things and, and those uh, aspects of his uh, of his job. Well, it plays very well with the elements within our fan base who are very anti Enoch and, and Daniel Levy because when Antonio Conte said things like squad's not good enough, needs investment, yeah. need new players, um, everyone in that sort of faction cheers because it's what they believe. And there's an element of truth to it, Spurs. I don't think um, you could argue that Spurs have suffered as a result of underinvestment. If you look back to um, you know, uh, the 2019 Champions League final, well... Um, Spurs' decline began before that, actually. And um, if you look where Liverpool are now and the kind of players that have been acquired, then, you know, case makes makes itself. Um, I think, um, I mean, I can only really speak from, from my own perspective, but I, I find it very boring, actually, because um, I believe in calling players out when they underperform and I believe in calling out executives who don't, uh, who don't allow a, a squad to grow and who don't provide the funding that you know providing funding when it exists at the same time though um it just becomes quite tedious because uh antonio conte is in a way someone that never really belongs to you i mean that's at least what he is at spurs because 
um, he's made sure that um, the perception exists all the time that at any given moment he could walk out. And that's still true now. Like he's still being asked you know, on a weekly basis whether you know he's going to be at Spurs next season. Hmm. And at some point you just think, okay, mate, but um, I, I don't know. Just it, 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 It's not what I... It doesn't play particularly well with some of my personality. Mm. I like a I like a head coach who buys into your culture and who wants to change things and who sees problems and issues, but is willing to um, to stick around to, or at least give the impression that he's willing to stick around to fight them or to 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 provide, like, create the and find the remedies for them. Yeah, there's Conte, been the impression of 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 this distance that he's 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 been conscious to create from from, from very early on, which has been a, I thought slightly strange, but is that is that what you're you're sort of describing? Yeah, hundred percent. Like, and it's it's a little bit contradictory because on the touchline, he is as you know, um, yes. <laughs> the most animated head coach in in, in world football, and yet. Um, and yet it's kind of you're constantly being reminded that oh well you know you, you're lucky to have me and I, I i suppose he's right because um Tottenham have made some awful decisions over the past few years um and they don't really deserve to be in the position to hire someone of his caliber at the same time um a lot of me just i suppose i the, the most succinct way of describing it harry is um i admire him i don't really have any affection for him um because um, as soon as there's something better, I'm sure he'll he'll vanish. Or as soon as as soon as um, the kind of the uh, the Tottenham climate, uh, you know, doesn't really suit him, then I'm sure he'll he'll be off. And in in the same sense that, and I I think you see this with players sometimes. You get to you you'll you'll know what this is like. You you get to the end of a year, and I mean this is probably true maybe 10, 15 years ago. And the club won't have achieved its objectives. It won't have I don't know, qualified for the Champions League. And a player will say something like, yeah, but I, I just want to be playing Champions League football. And you think to yourself, well, you had the chance to. Like, you, you were in the team and you were part of the reason why it didn't happen. You know, like, um, it's one of the things that got me really worked up about Harry Kane over the summer. Yeah. You, you, you think, okay, well, the club put you in a Champions League final, uh, which you weren't fit to play in, but you played it anyway. Um Gave you the platform to become England captain, World Cup golden boot winner, Premier League golden boot winner, um, and you know one of the highest paid club uh, players at the club. And yet, you kind of distance yourself from everything other than the things that you. I don't know any any part of failure. A certain character just says, "Well, you know that that's on everybody else. The success is me, but the things that haven't been done well, well, that's you." And and there's a bit of that to Conte because. I suspect that if Spurs don't finish in the top four or don't have Champions League football and then don't have the funds that come with that, then that will weigh into, um, that will factor into his decision uh, whether to stay or not. You think, well, um, you still coach the team that lost at home to Brighton and couldn't be Brentford. Um, and you have a responsibility. And I, I know that's old fashioned. And I know I sound like a right old bastard saying things like that because it's just not the way the game works anymore. But it annoys me and it, it stops me feeling anything for the coach, the team, the club. And I think that's why it really annoys me because I, I enjoy being involved and I enjoy having that emotional attachment. And with Conte, you know, truth be told, and um, I'm sure some people just don't really believe me, I'm not really bothered whether Tottenham finish in the top four. It doesn't really mean anything because I, at the moment I don't really feel as if the club is on it on a journey in the same way that it has been before. Like with early Pochettino years, you knew that, um, okay, it might not go well this year, but we'll have a go next year. Mm. And that's absent here. So you, you just, it's very difficult to um, to invest in that um, from a fan's perspective, I think. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what you're saying there around, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's you, you mentioned players who feel that way in terms of sort of, sort of shirking any responsibility for some of the yeah. failures. Um, and then you think about, yeah, the the managers that we were discussing as well. And there's, a, there's, there's one, Jose Mourinho, who's definitely, seemed to adopt that uh, strategy around sort of um, wins and losses. And you wonder how much that bleeds into, you know, some, even some of the players that he's managed that, you know, it was, very rarely yeah. is it his fault um, when things, when things go wrong. Um, but he's, he's quick to remind us of his, uh, his success whenever he has an op- opportunity. And you do think that some, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it probably has been, as you say, since what Pochettino, where it felt as though, there were numerous parties operating on more or less the same same level in terms of or not being together on the mission 
uh, maybe having slightly different views around sort of bi- building squads as it sort of things came to pass in the end for for Pochettino. But is, is that is that the last time where you felt like there was that real sense of unity across the board? I think so. I think so because I I think um, I think when you the Pochettino ending was was kind of tragic because um, I mean purely because of what it was first first and foremost, but also because of what it did in the sense that I, I think a lot of people, um, I think the club lost a lot of people when that happened. I don't mean in the permanent sense. I don't mean they, you know, they went off to non-league clubs in a sulk and never came back in. I just mean emotionally because um, I I don't, I can't remember an, a, a sort of a, a more unified moment mm. in the club's modern history than then. Um, I mean, it, since it, then. It, it affected me. I remember actually, <laughs> I, even as a rival fan, I remember looking at yeah. it and going, that strikes me as a very stupid thing to do because of how destabilizing it would be. Not even that you can maybe get a nice shiny new manager or, or whatever the reasons were around sort of the, the on the pitch stuff. It just felt like, a no, you've achieved quite a nice balance here, quite a, quite a nice equilibrium here. And uh, why disturb that, you know? Yeah. And also, I think um, one of the main issues with all the decisions that were made in the aftermath, whether they be managerial or um, in the transfer market, is that a lot of people knew that there were mistakes. Um, I think when Mourinho was sacked, uh, when Mourinho was appointed, a lot of people said, well, this isn't going to work because of X, Y, and Z. And um, a year later, it proved not to work because of X, Y, and Z. And that's very frustrating because it feels like um, it feels like you're you're kind of applying a feels like your your ambition is subject to a half life because you, you you just know that there's no long term future and I I think that's the case with some of these appointments. So Mourinho, you know you're not going to get more than two years. Um, Conte, I think is probably the same. Those two years may be different, but um, you're still you, he's not a dynastic manager, is he? He's not going to he's not going to reshape the way the club is thought of. He's there to do a few things, um, uh, decorate the CV a little bit, and then go off to wherever is you know primed for success next. Very, very good coach, but um, that is who he is. Nuno Espirito Santo was just simply a... I, I feel a little bit sorry for him, actually, because um, I think his appointment came at the end of a summer where the club had been... Uh, the, the, the supporters had been embarrassed by the club um, because, uh, well, the way they handled... Um, Mourinho's successor was just it was a disgrace actually um and because that you could see the clubs working and um you could see how little due diligence was actually going into some of the, the movements I think that was it was appalling I, I remember the the night of Reno Gattuso you know yeah. when, when it was sort of well hey this guy has done okay mm. we haven't actually thought about how he'll play with the kind of the supporters and you know we haven't gone as far as to look at you know what he believes in or what he seems or appears to represent but you know we'll have a go anyway and and i think um quite rightly a lot of fans just thought you know um it felt very hopeless at that stage and all things are relative harry i I Mm. a very wealthy club with a beautiful stadium and many 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 sporting advantages but um as a fan we're all entitled to kind of be a little bit insular at times like that and um Ah, oh, it hacked me right off all of that that summer. It was rubbish. Yeah, and I, I suppose you even sort of like, um, not to really dwell on this, but I remember when you were talking about um, uh, sort of that instability, that distance, um, and and I, I suppose with everything that had gone on with Kane, even sort of where where things appear to be at the moment and sort of how he's reintegrated himself to a certain extent anyway, um, yeah. Again, that's it's 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 creating distance, isn't it? I mean, even 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 despite some of those uh, inconsistent areas of the club and, and the things that were causing irritation, the fact that you had you know that him as a player who had that association with the club, uh, you know, and there was that affection, the fact that that was even sort of damaged as well. Yeah, I can I can understand why that's that's been difficult. I mean, just just, just jumping onto Kane, actually, I, I maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how how Conte's tried to to shape this. Um, this Tottenham side and, and, and sort of how they have evolved even sort of par- partially this season yeah. with with Kane and that situation around um, obviously the desire to move away the, the fact that it didn't come to didn't come to party then seemed to be um, taking a long time to sort of reintegrate himself fully but then also maybe there's more genuine questions around his his physical capacity um, at this stage yeah. as well 
which I think uh, have come more to the fore as as uh, he hasn't properly come back yeah to sort of a you know, peak Harry Kane whatever that is. Um, yeah, how, how have you found his his efforts at reintegration or the the efforts to reintegrate him into the side and um, just how much of a focal point he now he now currently is? Obviously dovetailing really well with uh, with Son on occasion on, on many occasions, which, which we'll come on to talk about with Hung Min Son um, in in a little bit. But that whole situation around Harry Kane, um, I, I, I mean, how you how do you feel about it right now? Oh, sorry, Harry. Just say that last bit again. I lost you. Oh, I was just, just asking how you feel about it right now in, in, in terms of sort of the um, everything to do with Harry Kane. Uh, indifferent, I think. Um, I think uh, Harry Kane has played his cards. Um, I don't think really anything has changed. I, I think we've kind of we've entered a, a period of appeasement, um, and I'm sure he still wants to go to a more successful club where he can he can pick up some. Premier League winners medals, hmm. and I would I would say pick up rather than win because I, yes, I think that's yeah. the dynamic today. Like I I think if you um, it's the Michael Owen back, dynamic. <laughs> well, yeah, because I think if you if you go and sign for Manchester City, um, that's kind of part of your signing on fee, isn't it? You know, you're just going to collect a few Premier League winners medals because um, uh, that's a that's the air in which that club exists and so it's it's difficult to take and i i do accept also that for, for people like me for fans of clubs like mine um this stuff is wrapped up in what we think of clubs that are run under those conditions um and i think that's a very fair grievance and a lot of people in modern football would feel the same way um with kane uh, actually kane kane kane's play has been often excellent. I mean, he had a very slow start to the season, admittedly. Um, Conte has been smart enough to import the Son Kane dynamic from previous eras. Um, and so actually, uh, it isn't much changed, but I, I think the understanding has deepened a little bit and um, Kane's playmaking ability is just, um, it's phenomenal. And he's a, he's an exceptional player and he, um, you know, and it's it's not a coincidence. Um, physically, I, I, don't, I don't detect a lack of effort. I just think that... Um, at times, uh, when Harry Kane is not fit, he looks really unfit. He's one of those guys. He's not someone that you can kind of, uh, you, you don't disguise his physical condition. When he's working his way back to fitness or he's off form, he looks very clunky as a footballer. And that will always be true. Um, I think he's a professional in the sense that he's always given his his best. I just, it's just such a shame, I think. You, you have this guy who grew up supporting the club, who was developed by the club, broke into the first team was part of an amazing journey. Um, and I would say part of, not the reason for. Like if you're looking back at that team and, you know, looking back at the effect of Pochettino or players like Toby Aldevaro, Jan Vertonghen or Misa Dembele, you know, um, I think it would be enormously disrespectful to say that Harry Kane has um, has carried Tottenham to this level or that, um, you know, he, he's due gratitude for that. I think he's been part of something wonderful and he's developed into a wonderful player. Um, but I don't. I don't. Not sure. I have that much affection for him now because I. I think um, his intent has been made clear, and I don't know. I, it's not a. It's not a. It's not a grievance. It's not a. There's no hostility. It's just a. Mm. It's more of a kind of. Oh, so actually, you're just one of those. And it's a. Okay. So it's, you just return to neutral with it because um, I think also the great irony is that um, as this has happened, I think there's been a lot of transference of affection towards Son Heung Min. Um, I was going to say, yeah. Because the thing about him is that, um, well, he's a phenomenal player. And there have been times this season where you just think you're much too good to be in this side. Because if you were playing for Barcelona or Real Madrid, you, you would be, um, you'd be probably not winning, but you'd be in the conversation around the Ballon d'Or. You, you'd be in that sort of top 10 or whatever. Um, and deservedly so. He, he's, he's got a wonderful attitude and he's a very um, likable personality. Um, and to us, at least. And it's great, and he's very quiet. He never causes any trouble. You never hear any noise. Um, he's never agitating, although he's entitled to. Recently signed a new contract, I think. Um, yeah, and he seems so, to have taken the club to his his heart from the outside. I mean, look again. Yeah, I, I would say that. Um, yeah, I would say he's the club's most popular player too. Um, and Kane's actions are involved in that. I don't want to sound pious because this is just football. He's uh, Harry Kane's entitled to to do what he wants. It's just that the cost of that. Mm -hmm. is um your kind of your special place as a homegrown talent um yeah. that's just that's the deal 
um, doesn't deserve any any nastiness or unpleasantness. Um, it's just um, that's the game today. And uh, yeah, so it's a strange one. I think um, come the end of the season, regardless of where Tottenham finish, um, it will all begin again. And I suppose things are a little bit different because Erling Haaland will, um, we expect, will arrive at Man City before much longer. I think that's that's the, that's the rumor and that's the expectation, um, which means that there'll be no Harry Kane in Manchester City, hmm. and then you're wondering whether um, anybody else really has the money to meet the asking price. Manchester United, but what are you achieving by moving to this Manchester United? You're actually going down in the table. I mean, you you'd earn more, but um, I think you'd lose respect for anyone that kind of moved down to go to um, that club at this particular time. Uh, great club that they are but um clearly in disarray and it's not a if you're a 28 29 year old player i don't think you're winning the premier league in your um at manchester united in the next two or three years which means that you're kind of you're not really moving for footballing reasons um so yeah i don't i don't know where his destination would be kind of he's sort of a man at a time isn't he harry kane because um <laughs> it's never quite worked out and i don't never felt to me as if man city were quite as serious about signing him as as he was about wanting to go there um that's just a hunch it's not based on anything it's just um it's just how i feel but it, it was it was a weird uh weird situation because um i a, a club with that amount of money and a player who's obviously worth more than they were willing to part with um it was just always felt odd to me mm. there's some horrendous sort of uh sort of nightmarish um swap deal uh around Lukaku and Kane isn't there somewhere in the ether you you can just sort of <laughs> some sort of fan fiction <laughs> sort of where Antonio Conte gets a striker that he's, he's probably sort of understands how to get the best out of Kane gets to stay in the Premier League I guess and but but the animosity would be oh, it'd be, be absolutely dreadful um but yeah I think I think I think you're correct there as well because if, you, if you're if you're looking purely at football reasons and you go well if you're prepared to put the the personal accolades of what you've done in the Premier League to one side, and you just want to go and experience things and win things. I mean, there's maybe, maybe there's some places you you could go, but I, I I do think that those those um those accolades, that, let's face it, yeah, it has worked quite hard to to accumulate. Um, pro- probably do mean quite a lot to him. So that's that's where your question of where well where does he go? Um, I I, I think is quite um is quite pertinent to be honest. Um. Just to move away from play, uh, move away from players for a second. I, I, we, we will come back to Sun, um, I think a, a little bit later. But in terms of there being a game, I mean, uh, so far in Conte's six months at the club, where you look at it and go, well, that that's, that, that is probably as close as we're going to get uh, with the current players he has at his disposal to how uh, you imagined a Conte uh, Tottenham team playing. Um, is there is there one that sticks in your mind? Yeah, probably Villa away. Okay, probably. I mean. Just because it seemed to it seemed to involve a lot of um, uh, Conte DNA in the sense that uh, it was quite ruthless. It was Villa played very very well that day. Uh, they actually battered Spurs in the first half, and um, uh, Conte was indebted to Hugo Lloris for a really terrific performance. Um, but the way I looked at it, it was a kind of well, they took the beatings and they were able to withstand it. It was very resilient. And then when the chances opened up, when kind of Villa punched themselves out a little bit, then um, it was pretty ruthless after that. And I think um, whether I'm right or wrong, I, I think from the outside, that's how I always perceived Antonio Conte's football is it, it had a kind of maddening quality to it in the sense that he it, it, it just won and um, it didn't really matter what you did in response. And that's probably how Villa fans felt. So it's, um, yeah, I, I suppose that's the one that sticks in my mind. And in, in terms of sort of the areas where you think that the the squad is most in need of of reinforcements, putting Conte's sort of sort of desires to aside for for the minute. Where do you think those areas are? And I'm sort of all, almost interested in terms of that th- there seemed to be under Pochettino definitely a clear plan around the the profile of players that were being targeted in terms of players that could be could be developed. And, and this is something that Conte has spoken about as well. I think um, of late around that you know these are the, the, that's the profile of players that Spurs are are looking at. You know, younger players who can develop. At, over time at the club, uh, and he was suggesting that you need to be targeting uh, you know, players a little bit older, um, maybe in their peak years, in, in order to you know, try and maximise the, the success you can achieve in the short term. I suppose very fitting with sort of his priorities, but also it seems fitting with sort of the way in which the club's priorities had shifted after Pochettino left. I'm, I'm just interested in sort of what you think 
the club would do in terms of, oh, these are the positions where we need to strengthen. But do you think they would opt for a younger uh, profile of player or do you think they are sort of now more in that um, short-term uh, mindset still? Yeah, I think I think they have to be short-term to appease Conte, actually. I mean, I think, um, well, uh, let's, let's do this in stages. So um, where do they need to strengthen uh, wing back, clearly? Um, the right side is a disaster. Always. Uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, I mean... I'm sure there's a, a good home for him somewhere in European football, but Emerson Royale is nowhere close to being a Conte wing back. Mm. Um, I, I feel myself age every time he touches the ball. It, it, everything <laughs> happens so slowly. Um, it's just, it's just not. It's, it, it's not that he's a bad player. It's just that he's 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 hopelessly wrong as a as in profile for this team, um, which is fine because he was bought for a different manager, so I can forgive it. But um, so yeah, right wing back, another centre half would be incredibly useful. And I think um, at some point uh, there's going to have to be a conversation about goalkeeping. Um, I think Hugo Lloris has been a, an excellent goalkeeper for a really long time. What I would say, though, is that um, he's 34 and he is, I mean, well, you're a Liverpool fan, so you'll know this. He doesn't like a big game, does he? Um he has cost us so many points in important situations. He makes great saves, and you remember those, and he should be applauded for those. And he has been uh, of the, you know, a, a very, very good goalkeeper for a decade. The thing is, though, that you put a ceiling on yourself if you know that you're going to have someone that chucks a couple in. I mean, he does it at Anfield every year. Yeah. There's often a every chaotic moment, isn't it? Even, oh. even in the was it the, the was, it, was it the World Cup final? I'm just trying to yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah where yeah, there was yeah, like yeah. You know, there was no need for there to be anything. <laughs> slightly unsettling and he just went let me just you know add a little bit of chaos into this and see, see what happens it's like um you know you know that old statistic on football manager like you know loves big games like <laughs> is, hates big games hates, hates them, them. Yeah. it's i mean the thing is, is it's a really strange thing to say um for someone who's experienced as many games as he has he's played world cup finals european championship finals yeah european cup finals um, so it's a, it's a quite, it's quite a strange attribute and he does have a lot of really good human qualities and which, which make him a good captain. But the, the problem is, is that, um, it's just the mistakes you, you don't, um, I, that they're, they're, they're too frequent and it's too much of it. It's almost like a kind of a meme within Tottenham fandom. Like, you know, oh, he just, you know, he's dropped that one or he's a little bit weak under crosses or he'll make a bad decision. His hands can be a little bit soft. And yeah, to a certain extent, some of his reflex saves and some of the moments he's produced do make up for that. It's just that you really feel the cost of the mistakes when they occur in big games. Um, mm. And unfortunately, that's just been the case. No, absolutely. I, I think in in terms of you saying sort of short term to appease Conte, but you're also th also thinking about sort of maximising, you know, the potential impact that certain star players can have as well. And I think that brings us on to just speak about Sun Hume in a little bit. Um, and you know, the, I remember in the past I was speaking um, around him and you saying that you weren't, you weren't necessarily convinced by him as a, as sort of an all round player that he was clearly very talented, but you were sort of questioned sort of how, uh, the, how consistent the all round level of his performances could be, I think for, for Tottenham a while ago. Um, it seems to really develop that side and tell me if I'm wrong on that. And he's still maybe a moments player in, in in some instances, but um, the way in which he, on many occasions, in, in some of my opinion anyway, it seems to have been able to step up when Harry Kane hasn't been there, um, or there's been some noise or some clouds around the club. Um, I've 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 often found quite um, striking, to be honest, because those those sorts of players who are able to do that, um, I mean. Fans tend to be very affectionate towards them, um, and yeah, he's it's it's, it's 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 not hard not to like um, uh, you know, Son. But um, in terms of his his development this season, his his increased sort of focal focal role in the side this season, um, what you think of of how he's playing? I think he's currently what within three of uh, of Salah in terms of sort of the the race for the Golden Boot this season as well. Um, yeah, just what what have you made about sort of the way in which he's grown um, as a figure at Spurs? Well, I mean, I, I still think he's patchy, Harry. Mm. I mean, he, he's he's a um, still think a moment. Um, 
Well, I, I don't know. Maybe it, it, I mean, I, I do remember saying that, and I, I think that might have been harsh. I, I think what I probably should have said is that he plays in patches of form. Um, right, okay. Yeah. When he's hot, he's lethal. When he's bad, um, he... He's, he's not bad when, when, when he's when he's sort of six out of ten um he can have very little influence on games i still think i see him as a kind of a component at spurs and it, like he's reliant on um not reliant but he, he's a beneficiary of like you know kane's playmaking or good delivery um yes he can um produce individual moments and, and win games of course he can it's just that um every, in every season if a season is nine months long there'll probably be three months cumulatively where he isn't as at his best he's not like i wouldn't put him in mohammed salah's category like i wouldn't um he might be in a better team i understand but um because he has to do so much at spurs because um for a long time particularly um you know towards the end of the pochettino reign and for most of the last couple of years um if he hasn't played well if either he or kane hasn't played well um then there isn't really a tottenham attack to speak of <laughs> um then you seem to. I think you get. I think. I, I think he suffers a little bit from wear and tear over right. the course of the season. And also, you, you shouldn't forget. Um, obviously, every international break, he travels enormous distances. Mm. Um, loves playing for his country, which is great. Um, but obviously, the cost of that is jet lag and injuries and soft tissue issues. And um, I think this season, I, I might be wrong, but I, I think he had a touch of COVID, um, which uh, put him out for a while. Um, which is obviously a difficult thing for a professional athlete to to deal with, but uh, yeah, it's um tricky one. Um, fabulous player, but he's just not. He's not a um, he's not going to be a world beater for thirty eight games of a season. That's all. Hmm. So almost more of a jotter. I mean, if I'm trying to make sort of comparisons directly with Liverpool here, but it, it, that's that's my maybe co- more of a Mane. Actually. A Mane, like okay. Jota, I, I love Jota. I just. Mane to me is I I love Sadio Mane. There's no bigger fan um, than me. But I I think of him as someone who is a kind of maybe a, a seven out of, and a half out of ten player for um, maybe a third of a season and an absolutely fantastic one for two thirds. Mm. Um, and I think I put Son in that category. That's just the guy that is yeah. I, I, Jota I, I don't mean in disrespect to Jota. I I love him. He's he's an excellent footballer. But um, yeah, just um, I would I would. I've always um, perversely wondered what Son would do in Liverpool's side. I think he'd be brilliant. Um, yeah, I've always... Uh... <laughs> I don't, never want to see it happen, obviously, but I, I do still have that curiosity. Yeah, no, he is. I think each and every time there's a, a post-match hug between him and uh, Klopp, I do I, I do wonder. I do wonder, but um, yeah, I'll just have to go in the pantheon of yeah, you'll, <laughs> you'll never know or sort of what-ifs at pub quizzes and things like that. I mean... The other player I want to talk about as well, because again, it feels sort of slightly strange, is he's on loan, um, Kulazewski, uh, and his his impact. Um, I, I really had no idea he was as young as he is, and that's every time I've sort of rediscovered Amazing, that fact, it? I've been yeah. struck, struck by it. But um, it, yeah, you mentioned Ben Tanker earlier on, and sort of the the classiness that he's brought in um, in uh, central midfield. Um, what have you made of uh, Kulazewski? Because I'm, I'm very impressed by sort of um, the way in which he's seemed to adapt to life in the in the Premier League, both in terms of um, so, some of the end product I've seen from him, but also just the, uh, the how combative he is. Yeah, I, I think I underestimated him as a player. Mm. I mean, I I knew he was a good player. I didn't I didn't think I appreciated how good a player he was. Um, also, I didn't realize that there's a bit of devilment to him, Harry. Like he's a bit nasty. Oh, good, nice way. good. You need you need you need yeah, those. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you do. You do you need someone that. Um, I mean, occasionally he. he um, I forget who it was, but he nearly got himself sent off against Brighton. Yeah, yeah that's it. He um he tried to elbow Cucurella, um, which is. So <laughs> how can you elbow that guy? <laughs> yeah, how can you? How you how, it's just it's just great. Like right. Um, but um, no, he's been excellent. A bit nuggety and nasty, and um, all the all the ability in the world. And I think he's actually. Um, I'd have to look it up, but I think he's, he's among the leading assist makers. Um, in the Premier League, uh, and uh, not like, in total. I, I just mean he's pretty high up the charts, despite um, you know uh, only arriving in January, <laughs> which is kind of cool. No, absolutely. Yeah, he's 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 he's, he's seemed very involved, and in, and again, not somebody who doesn't shirk away from uh, you know, really establishing themselves on some on some very big games. Um, thinking even sort of his impact against uh, against City um, earlier. 
in the season as well. I, mean, I, I suppose we, we, we come on sort of naturally now to, to the run in, because I think that's what people are going to be talking about relentlessly now for the next, um, uh, what is it, only four games. Um, but in terms of, uh, the, the, the race for top four, I, I've got no jingles or music to play in the background there, but, um, I'm <laughs> sure there's going to be a lot <laughs> that's made around, um, the, the North London derby that has been scheduled the way it has been in, in the end and actually now is going to probably give uh, give the TV networks exactly what they want in terms of it maybe being uh, decisive. Um, but yeah, where do you currently stand? I mean, do, do you where do you currently stand on sort of whether um, the the club's chances of finishing in the top four? Do you think that, as you talked about earlier on, if, 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 if they don't, um, it's hard to know whether or not it will be um, you know, pivotal in terms of Conte staying or the money being available and this and that. It's, it's it sounds like you're 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 slight, slightly detached from it anyway, as sort of many fans might be, just given the current situation and the bunch of different narratives running on at the club. But um, what are your sort of opinions on on whether or not Spurs will make it, and, how, and just how important that is? Um, no, I, I think the chance is gone. I, I think um, I think they blew it with that loss to Brighton and then the draw at Brentford. Um, unfortunately, um, also, I, I, I mean, the game hasn't actually started at Anfield yet, but I'm already surprised that we're not two 0 down. <laughs> <laughs> so what I, I, the thing is is that I, I imagine by the end of the weekend, um, you know, the, the gap will be five points to Arsenal. They've got a pretty easy game against Leeds at home, and mm-hmm. that that will be gone. But then that's okay because I think Arsenal will probably deserve it. Arsenal have um, Arsenal played very well this season, and the, some of the football's been excellent. Um, and I don't know. I mean, also I I think it's a bit of a trick of the mind, Harry. I think that the importance of Champions League football, these little sort of, um, you know, quasi trinkets that you can pick up if you're not, you know, owned by a Gulf state. Um, no, I don't care about them as much. I used to, I used to, but then I, I kind of, I want the other stuff. I want the kind of the, um, you know, the more subtle aspects of it. Um, and, um, I don't know. I, I like Champions League football, but Tottenham are going to win the Champions League. So, I, I don't know. I mean, it would also, if you said to me at the beginning of the season, you know, fifth place, get out of that Europa Conference League, and I can't tell you how terrible it is. <laughs> just, <laughs> I can't, I just can't. It's so, it's just awful. Like, there's no, it's not even like Premier League arrogance. It's just a terrible, terrible feeling being in the Conference League. <laughs> um, so, Europa League, fifth, fifth place, you know, um, a little bit of progress, you know, a couple of good players arrived. You know, I mean, it's okay. It's okay. I'm okay with that. And if, if um if there's no Champions League football, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to sulk about it. Yeah, it's uh, sort of in, the, in in a weird position of late actually. I mean, not that I've been sort of suffering when it comes to football for for a while. Um, but I just yeah, I, I'm almost feeling at this stage. Um, and this is not not just through chatting to you. I've got, I've got a number of friends who um, are just not not that happy watching their football club at the moment. To be honest, um, no. and. Uh, hearing you speak there around, um, you know, disregarding trophies and things like that, but actually it's, it's, it's the other stuff and sometimes the, the intangibles and, uh, that you can get from a manager being united with the club and players, you know, all, all, all battling for the same thing and, and united with the fan base. And it, 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 I, I do feel very, um, sort of, uh, almost, uh, What's the right word? Not greedy. Um, spoiled. Yeah, just spoiled at the moment, to be honest, because obviously that, at, at this stage, Liverpool seem to have it all um, in terms of uh, the that that union there and uh, obviously the, the the success that's on the pitch at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I, I was just gonna I was just gonna ask you for your for your opinion on Liverpool this season because it's always interesting to hear your uh, hear your perspective on the side, and I think you're always pretty pretty honest about things as well. But yeah, just your I guess just your thoughts on Liverpool this season, and if there's a particular player actually that for you this season's probably stood out more than than in previous seasons, or um, Liverpool would be great. Actually, I, I I was one of the people that really underestimated Liverpool at the beginning of the season. Um, I thought that kind of the cycle wasn't ending, but I just thought that um, with the Lukaku signing at Chelsea, and you know, with the hundred million investment in in Grealish at Man City, uh, it would be a bit too much. But then I think. Salah's. I, di- I didn't realize Salah had this gear. I thought we'd already seen the very best of him. Also, mm. whenever players get towards the end of the contract, you think maybe um, 
you know, there'll be a little bit of a tailing off. I thought we'd seen the best of Mane. I thought that um, Firmino's days were kind of numbered. Like Jota's progression has been really encouraging. Also, Luis Diaz. I knew of Luis Diaz. Uh, and I kind of happened to think that he'd be the perfect Premier League player. Um, but I didn't think it would be... I didn't think it would look quite like this. Also, I didn't think that a player who came in in January would have the impact that he did. Because it's so rare. Um, particularly when it's a player coming from, you know, not the Bundesliga, not La Liga, but, you know, a, a, a competition outside the traditional top five. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's been incredibly impressive. Um, and also his adaption to a Liverpool style, because it's one thing just saying, right, well, this is a good player and he's going to come play for your team. It's another thing to actually get proper utility out of him. Mm. Um, and I suppose the other one is, um, I thought kind of, clearly naively, but I, I thought that Van Dijk might suffer a little bit of a hangover from such a long injury absence. Um, because it, I mean, for someone like that who relies so much on, I mean, it, balance, I suppose, pace, yes, but really I'm, I'm talking about balance, kind of his, um, you know, if you think about Virgil van Dijk in one-on-one situations, like the balance of his body is just perfect always. Yeah. And when you have something that interferes with it, especially an injury, that's serious. I, I thought there would be a kind of a very subtle decline. And then I, I suppose I imagined a little bit of a, a ripple effect of, well, you take Van Dijk out of that Liverpool defence, and yeah. Um, but Matip's been very good, I thought. Trent Alexander-Arnold's form has been super. Um, also, I mean, I suppose this is a more recent thing, but I thought, I'd kind of given up on Naby Keita. Um, I, I'm happy to admit yeah. that. I, I was that, um, I was alone on, I, was, I, was, I remember, <laughs> remember speaking to Carl Anker at the start of the season and he was asking me for, um, it's actually very cool quite funny referring to him as Carl Anker. Um, I remember speaking to Carl at the start of the season and him saying, I want your bad, your bad predictions for the season. Yeah. yeah and yeah, I was yeah. like, uh, I still believe in uh, Nabby season. Nabby case. Yeah, it, 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 it could be around the corner. And uh, the, the the amount of abuse I got of like, oh, mate, yeah, we, we need to get you off the wagon or something. You need to let it go, right? Yeah. No, well, I mean, I... Um, it's as close as we've come. I did, I did see a bit of him when he was at Leipzig. And... I thought that I was I was very much on the hype train when he arrived because I thought that was just a brilliant deal. I thought he was just going to be fantastic, transformative footballer. Um, that obviously didn't happen, but I think um, it's really nice to see a player recover a little bit of their reputation. I don't know what the future holds for him, um, but I think people I think people now see why there was hype at least. Yeah. Um, and the the kind of the range in his game, the things that he does with the ball. Like I, I think he's a super player. I just think, you know, the situation hasn't quite been right at times. But, uh, yeah. And he's so, also passed that test, I think, that sort of solely exists in English football where it's, uh, you have to do it in a couple of big games. And he, I think, I think he's, 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 he's now done it in enough big games that people, I mean, people still dispute it. I, I can tell you that. But you, you, you can now put a pretty good YouTube compilation, uh, together for, for him at the very least in terms of sort of him, him showing up in, 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 in pretty massive games. I think so. And I, the, the general point about Liverpool here is that um, it seems like every time you've needed a player to elevate their form and provide a little bit of momentum or a little bit of class or um, to produce moments that matter with it over a course of you know two or three weeks, it's been a different guy. Obviously, for Salah, it was about six months, ridiculously. And his level was absurd. Um, but what's been interesting is that as Salah, not dropped off, because that makes it sound like he's out of form, but has kind of gone back to being 8 out of 10 Mohamed Salah rather than 10 out of 10. Like you've seen Sadio Mane emerge from, you know, his, his form was not good pre-AFCON. Um, and he didn't have a good AFCON either after the kind of the concussion. Um, but um, regards to, you know, how the competition finished, of course, um, I mean, individually, he, he was kind of mediocre. Since he's come back, he's been absolutely excellent um, most of the time. And that's been, I think that's the difference when you have lots of people that you, you don't depend on one player. Liverpool don't. Um, and I think that's a tremendous advantage because, I mean, you, you see the difference. Like, I mean, if you want to talk about Spurs, right? If you take Kane out of that side or Kane's not playing well, Spurs don't win. Same with Con. Uh, Con. So that's that's maybe that's the crappiest kind of um, collective nickname for Son Young Min and Harry Kane, Con. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean. If you take Son out of that, yeah. or he's not fit, then the the team is entirely different. Whereas Liverpool, there's always another person. It seems you can step into the gap, and that's um, got one asset. Yeah, it seemed that way this season. I remember at the start of the season, my my sort of doubt about this side was 
didn't really think that they were a side that could control games on the ball if it wasn't for the presence of Thiago and uh, Fab. I thought, I thought if, if if those two are there, um, it doesn't matter what combination you put around them. If those two are there, well, they can, they can pretty much control a game on the ball against most sides. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And yeah, um, let's face it. I mean, even though we've been all too, we've been treated to, to the Thiago highlight reel over the past, it feels like a couple of months at least. But when he's not been there, I think you know, Kate has done his best to try and dovefold. Henderson doesn't doesn't really play that way, so can't really do that role either. Uh, so that was my sort of worry. And actually, thinking about the last Tottenham game as well. It was, a very good example of it, given who was available. But I, I even think of the Chelsea games. Oh, there's there's been games that season where I just thought there's there's just no way a side that has a you know those two in it um, seeds control of a game like that actually. And the, the only time I've seen it was last night against Villarreal. I thought they were just magnificent yeah, well, for forty five yeah. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a what a strange game! What an excellent game! But yeah, a strange game. Mm. Okay, well then, I, 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 I suppose as 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 we wrap things up, then Seb, I mean, you 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 said that you already feel like um, Tottenham are two 0 down already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing you're not necessarily um, holding out um, a lot of hope for um, the weekend's game. Um, so I suppose I, I'll put you on the spot and ask you another horrible prediction in terms of um, do, do do you think Liverpool are going to win things? <laughs> <laughs> or uh, it's hard to. Um, I, I usually just pick one thing, and, and again, I'm, I'm feeling like a, a spoiled person here. But <laughs> you I know to get me to predict you for a quadruple. <laughs> I, just, I don't want to do that. That's just like so. It's horrendous, right? I, I mean, actually, know, what I was going to ask you about was the league, um, and I think that's. Oh, I see. Yeah. But... Um, yeah. No, I, I, the thing is, is that I, I, I don't, I don't know about the quadruple. I just, I don't see Liverpool losing. The thing is, what, what interests me. Is that I was watching that the game last night, yeah, and um, Villarreal game, and I remember thinking, I think I, I tweeted this, like Liverpool got absolutely battered for forty five minutes. They were they bullied actually physically, and I remember thinking, yeah, but you know what's going to happen? There'll be a calm, composed dressing room. Klopp will sort it out and because these players have achieved so much together and experienced so much together. The solution will be very, very calm. Think clearly under pressure, right? Um, and then I got to thinking, well, I didn't post this because I just couldn't be bothered with the kind of sensitivity that it would provoke. If Man City had found themselves too down to Villarreal, in Villarreal, then it lost, yeah. then it gone out. Because right. okay. something something happens to Man City in the Champions League. Um, and as, so, at some point that will change. Um, I just, I, I think I, I mean, I, I think I trust Liverpool to win. And to navigate the kind of the difficult corners that the season still has left, and I don't think that's a measure of ability, quality, who's the biggest team, who's you know what, all that stuff. I, I, I don't, I don't care. I, I just think Liverpool are a bit smarter, and I think there's a little bit more. Um, I don't know what it is, but I, I just, I just trust them to get it done. And I don't really have a, a horse in this um, race. I, I, I don't really mind too much who wins, but. Um, yeah, I just it's a. Whereas I, we go and we're recording this obviously about half an hour before Real Madrid, mm. Man City, and maybe Man City going thump Real <laughs> in the five nil in the Bernabeu and prove me wrong, maybe. But it wouldn't surprise you, no, if no. something silly was to happen because they should have won the Champions League last year. Uh, they also should have won the Champions League when, um, well, they should have got to the final. It should have, Liverpool should have been playing Man City in the twenty nineteen final, not Tottenham. Um, you know because they never should have lost that game either. Um, and yet, somehow, despite all the money, all the great players, and this manager, there is always something that seems to go wrong. And I don't get that sense with Liverpool, but I do with City. So yeah. I, I would say, um, yeah, I'll, um, I, I'm sure um, Liverpool will brush the other side of the weekend and then go on to, to win the league, I'm sure. Well, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's it's it's. Um... Is that the answer you wanted, Harry? <laughs> I I, 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 it's probably some sort of psychological thing here, but I, 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 I'm just I'm just trying to convince myself still that this is actually all all still happening. To be honest, I think I think I think it's 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 quite surreal. Um, but that, I suppose yeah, when you when you put people in charge who do a good job and are calm and uh, do things methodically, I suppose yeah. After a long period of time, this is sort of what can happen i guess but i'm i'm st- i'm still still sort of slightly um in awe of it to be honest um uh, but I, I i do very much agree with you around the the one thing about this team that does doesn't really surprise me much anymore is that they 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 figure it out you know that you, you can pose them six different kind of problems 
uh, and and they that ninety percent of the time they'll figure it out, um, and they'll get themselves back into something. Even if they can't win it, they'll get themselves back into it, which is, um, yeah, a very um. Well, very... it's it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because that Villarreal game. So this is there was a very stark comparison between a team that were comfortable where they were in that situation and a team who weren't. Because um, on the one hand, you had Villarreal home crowd behind them, two goals, one of the best halves they've played this season. They were fantastic. fantastic yeah. Brilliant. But then, when it comes to actually winning the game, you have the goalkeeper that melts down. And I really like Geronimo, really. I think he's a super goalkeeper. But he is prone to bad moments. Um, goalkeeper who uh, loses the plot a little bit, lets him from very soft goals and kind of disintegrates emotionally throughout the evening. Hmm. Um, the midfield linchpin who, yeah, the game was over by this point, but gets himself sent off. It's the difference between um, it, knowing how to win, right? And the solutions you're talking about and the problems. And, you know, the, the thing is, is that when Fabinho scored his goal, like a, a reasoned, rational response to that from a season's team would have been, well, we're just going to get another one. There's no way goals. And for Villarreal, it was like the sky had fallen in. And it was mm. over. It was over the minute that went in. And everyone knew it. Everyone knew it, including all the Villarreal players. Um, and that's a kind of, um, it's interesting to see how, it's interesting to see Liverpool grow into that space because I think it's the kind of it's the rarest area you can find in, in football. Real Madrid have it too. Like when Real Madrid were getting smashed by Chelsea on their own pitch, um, it was fine because you know someone would look at Modric came up with probably the yeah. past of the decade, you know, and, <laughs> and just some teams have it, man, because like you put like someone like Modric has won, you know, um. I mean, he'd probably run out of space in his house for European Cups. You know, they very much have it. Actually, they very they, they they very much have it. And actually, that's part yeah, that's partially why. If if I was to pick an opponent, I I, I would pick. I, I I would pick Madrid for a couple of reasons for the Champions League final. But um, I'm I'm very aware that they have a manager and a bunch of players who have that quality, <laughs> which is yeah. which is very difficult to deal with no matter how good you are if if they also know exactly how to win and i think they, they, they've been doing it for for longer let's face it so it is just yeah. they just they just know they're just comfortable in that space right yeah. they're just comfortable mm. when um the whole world is watching in fact they love it mm. and, and it must be terrifying um, to face that actually <laughs> it really must be terrifying. because it's like it's like it's like um it's like a, a waking nightmare isn't it because you just know there's a like that that i mean the game will start in a minute and, and maybe this will be look silly in hindsight. Yeah, but when I was watching the first leg of City at uh, Real and City could probably have been four up in half an hour. Mm. But you just knew that somewhere Benzema would do something and that would change everything. And it's just it's just it's a like it's like a boxer who can get punched in the face for eleven and a half rounds, but then knock somebody out in the twelve. Like yeah. it's 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 a strange quality, it's very rare. Um, but goodness me, it's valuable, isn't it? And um, Liverpool have that. Um, as you say, maybe not quite as much as Real Madrid do, yeah. um, but uh, Liverpool yeah. have plenty of it. Yeah, there's some sort of like you know, they've been moulded by it, you know, <laughs> over yeah, exactly. over many years. But um, no, it's yeah, it's, it's like uh, it's like the Bane quote about exactly. Like, uh, you yeah. know, being raised merely adopted. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you merely adopted the nous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Madrid of yeah, I mean Luka Modric, God dear Lord, yeah, um, the, the, those guys in that midfield is just never never f- ceases to amaze Outrageous. me. Um, but Outrageous. anyway, I think yeah, we, we probably we probably ended up on a. It, I'm sure this is, it, it's a tangent that's going to be interesting to um, to all the listeners anyway. But um, as always, Seth, thank you for coming on um, and sort of giving us your your viewers sort of Spurs this season, which has been a sort of a complicated and um, you know not without its turbulence um, this season. And uh, it's very difficult to sort of correctly predict, I, I suppose, or sort of confidently predict where they'll be um, in six months. But I'm hoping for sort of more more stable times, to be honest. But um, as as always, thank you very much for, for all your insights, Seb. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me back, Harry. And um, yeah, to all the to listeners, um, th- these pods keep coming, and um, yeah, keep, they keep being relevant as as the games uh, are all very important at this stage, obviously. So there'll th- there'll be another rival recon uh, for a game that I didn't know existed, uh, to be honest, which is uh, the the Aston Villa game on the tenth of May. Uh, so there, there will definitely be a podcast that comes out before that one, and of course, yeah, with these with these um, with these cup finals coming up as well, there'll be there'll be plenty of pods with 
coverage around those games as well. So do do uh, sort of be sure to check out those on Anfield Index Pro as well. But uh, until then, yeah, I'll see you again ahead of the, the Aston Villa game on uh, on the 10th of May. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.